So thanks for having us uh, in your offices for the start today. You're most welcome. How do you see the future? Well, I'm, I, I should be retired now, but I cannot imagine ever to retire because there is so much to do and there's so much to explore and so many wonderful countries to visit that nowadays I travel a lot and I visit a lot of countries because what I came up with is well, pretty well known in the Netherlands, but outside the Netherlands it's rather new. So I'm always curious to see and to hear how people respond when, when you know, when I'm in India or in China or in, and and whatever, wherever I go. Which are the things on which you are really proud? <laughs> uh, you know, pride is is something that I find difficult. I mean, I'm, I I feel very fortunate. I came up with some ideas that really seem to be very uh, beneficial for people. People really enjoy the things I say. Um, and, but I don't feel pride. It's more grateful. I'm very grateful. Um, because it's not something you can, you can think of. It, uh, I felt like it was given to me, some insights. And uh, spreading these insights make, makes me very uh, grateful and to hear the responses of people and get lectures of a father who now finally you know re can reconnect with his son because he understands what's going on between them you know these are the things that really make me uh, make me smile you gave one example of the father reconnecting to his son yeah can you give me two more examples of this great <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it happens all the time. You know, when I give workshops and lectures, people f very uh, they start to understand who they are and why they respond the way they respond. They they see how they interact with other people, how they get irritated, and what it can teach them about themselves. You know, we tend to look at other people. Uh, and see their flaws and uh, their mistakes. But when you start to recognize what it says about you, or what you can do about it, and that it's your own responsibility to create you know, fruitful relationships, that makes people happy, and it makes me happy. So um, it's all about getting to know yourself, understanding who you are, taking away the pressure of that you, that you have to change. You know, nowadays, everybody is working on themselves, which I think is ridiculous, because you can't work on yourself. So that's one of the things. And then people said, but you know, we should change. Change is the sort of the, 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 the thing that seems to be important. And I think, yeah, I mean, there is a world we can change. There's a world we can make. The external world, you know, if you want to change this room, you know, get a designer and you know, make a plan and execute it. But your inner world doesn't work like that. Your inner world is not the world you can make. It's the world you can experience and you can explore and you can get to know yourself. And that helps. That helps uh, people to find a sort of inner peace with themselves. I always say people are not bad. People are unconscious. We don't know why we are doing what we are doing. We have no clue. And to start to understand uh, you know, what drives you and uh, why we behave the way we behave is, I think, extremely important. Not in order to change, but in order to get to know yourself and learn to accept yourself as you are. Imperfect, out of balance, not always nice, but, you know, can you, can you embrace yourself? Can you, if you say it in, in more beautiful words, can you love yourself being incomplete? If you can do that, that is really, that brings a smile to people's faces. In, in this country here in the Netherlands, we have, for example, personal development plans. And I think that's, that's a contradictio in terminus. You, you cannot plan your personal development. You know, you, you can plan the books you're going to read and the films you're going to, to, uh, to see and that sort of thing, but your development you cannot plan it. I, I ask this question almost every time to a group. I say, can anybody in the room tell me that who he is is the result of a plan? And so far I haven't met anybody 
who was capable of saying that who he was was the result of a plan. And in the meantime, you know, we, we bother people in organizations that they have to make a personal development plan, which I think puts pressure on people. Because in fact you're saying, you know, you're not good enough, you should change, and you have to work on yourself. Well, these are, I think, what, what, what we're saying with it is that our inner world is makeable. And it isn't. And it's time that we start to realize that you cannot make your inner world. Um, you could say, in your inner world, change cannot be a goal. Change is an effect. And it is an effect of getting to know yourself, understanding yourself, accepting yourself, and then you will change as a result. But if you make it a goal, you don't understand how the inner world works. I think that would really change a lot of things, in, especially in the HR community, because HR people have the tendency to think in terms of makeable, that things are makeable. And, and that's sad. It's, it puts pressure on people. I mean, I once had, actually it was in Belgium, one person standing up in the, in, in the, in the audience when I was giving a speech, and this person was really angry. And he shouted at me, and I said, so I owe this to you. And I said, what happened? And he said, I had to make one of those quadrants of yours from my boss. My boss told me to make one. And then I had to write down what my challenge was, and I had to write the plan of how to work on it. And I refused it. And he was really pissed off. And uh, my only you know, response was, I think you understand it better than your boss. Because if, you know, if that's what we're going to teach people that you know they have to change and and improve and you know that who you are is not okay that's really sad that there are different planets there are different realities there's a world we can make we, we can make iPhones we can make fantastic technology that's the world we can make but our inner world is of, of a completely different nature and the moment we approach the inner world as if it is makeable we make a huge mistake. How would you describe this very briefly? What's the inner world? Thinking? Feeling? Doing? Your inner world is the world you can experience. It is how, you know, we are here in this room and we have, we, all the people here have a different experience. So how you experience uh, reality, daily activities, your work, your interactions, your relationship is your inner world. It's completely subjective. Nobody experiences a situation the same. That's what I call your, your inner world. And uh, that, is, that is determined by a lot of factors. And one of them, I think, is uh, the, the theme that I'm approaching quite a bit, and that's your core qualities. I, I think every individual is born with a number of qualities, like you know, persistence, caring, empathy, uh, uh, preciseness, flexibility, there are hundreds of qualities. I think in the English language I have something around 300 different qualities. In the Dutch language I have around 250, so maybe English speaking people have more qualities, at least they have more words for it. So, and everyone has a few of those that you were born with, and that's what I call a core quality. And my assumption is that if you can express these qualities in, in your work, in your daily life, you probably feel good about yourself and are probably in the right place. If you cannot express these qualities, you, know, you may be in the wrong place and may not feel so good about yourself. So the essence of a core quality is that it is effortless. If you were born with preciseness, Everything you do, you will do with preciseness. If you are born with caring, then everything you do is, is colored by that quality. So core qualities color your, what you see, they color how you behave, they color your interactions. So I think it's important that people know these, these core qualities because they're really your resources that you have, that are easy for you. If you were born with determination, to be determined will be no problem at all. It's effortless. It's even hard not to be determined if you're born with it. It's, 
difficult not to be flexible if you were born with flexibility. So it's nice when people start to understand what these core qualities are. It's like these are the gifts of the universe and you got them at birth. It has nothing to do with your upbringing or your education or uh, I mean of course we are partly nature, your core qualities, and partly nurture. That's what comes from outside. Your education and your parents have had an impact on you as well. This is all about finding out what, what belongs to you, has always belonged to you. So what are these qualities that uh, were given to you? Now that, I think, is an interesting journey and, and gives a sort of insight in, in your inner world. Now, to, in order to find out, it's interesting to realize that you're not only born with your core quality, but also with your pitfall. Because your pitfall is simply too much of your quality. If you are born with preciseness, then maybe nitpicking is your pitfall. Uh, if you were born with flexibility, maybe wishy-washiness is your pitfall. If you were born with determination, maybe pushiness is your pitfall. It's too much of something good. So we also have something beautiful and as a sort of gift for free, you get your pitfall. It's simply too much. Only once in the last 20 years I had somebody who said, I have no pitfall. That was, <laughs> that was funny because his neighbor he was sitting next to him. He whispered just loud enough so that every, everybody could hear it. How about arrogance? And he stood up and said, I'm not arrogant at all, in a way that radiated arrogance in a fantastic way. So there, there are, I could say, I would say hopeless people. There are very, very few that think that they have no pitfall. 99.9% .9 of the people would admit that yes, your core quality has a shadow side. There is no light without shadow. That's, I didn't come up with that, that's how the universe works. <laughs> So your, your beauty has a shadow side, and that's your pitfall. So if people would only realize that whenever you see something in another person that you don't like, by definition, it is always too much of something beautiful, it would change the world. If that's the only thing people would realize. What you see in other people you don't like is always too much. If I'm pushy, that's not nice, but the beauty behind it is determination. If we, start to, if we would start to look behind what we don't like and we start to look for the beauty in people, it, you, know, you, you, you start to discover that every individual has core qualities. So, uh, and we are so much focused on what we don't want. What we don't like, what's bad, this idea of core qualities and pitfalls is an attempt to change that and to help people to start to look for value in people rather than, you know, what, what's not good enough. So pitfall and quality simply belong together. There's no way you can escape it. And um, so why not simply accept it as, as the consequence of your beautiful side? So that's one thing that can help you. I mean, if you don't know your core qualities, it's very, usually very easy. You just have to ask yourself, what, you know, what do people tell me when they say, don't be so da 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 da. What do you hear? Don't be so da da. That's probably your pitfall. And then you think back and think, okay, of what is it too much? And you probably have already one of your core qualities. So it's not that difficult to discover it. It's just a matter of uh, what do you pay attention to. So use your pitfall to find out what's worthwhile. That's one sort of consequence of your qualities. The, the second consequence is you also have a challenge. If, you know, for example, if you have determination and, and the shadow side is pushiness, you're being a pitfall. Your challenge is the opposite of that, not being pushy, which is something like maybe patience. 
So for determined people, it's important to develop patience. That, if you are patiently determined, or determinedly patient, if you can find the balance between your core quality and your challenge, you, you're very, very effective. So, and that's true for every quality. If you have flexibility, maybe the pitfall is something like wishy-washiness, and maybe your challenge is something like consistency. If you are flexibly consistent, of consistently flexible, then you have found that balance. So in every, in every individual you have a quality and a challenge. There's no escape. And the funny thing is that we often look for the challenge outside ourselves. Because there's a chance of 95% that the core quality of your life partner or your best friend is your challenge. So determined people often have a very patient partner. Uh, if you have, for example, caring, caring is beautiful quality. If you are too caring, it's something like smothering, pampering. Maybe the challenge is something like confronting, direct. If you can be direct and caring at the same time, fantastic. But people who have, who have this quality of caring often feel attracted to somebody who is more direct. So unconsciously, we are all more or less looking for our challenge in somebody else, which is fine. Except that this challenge can also be too much. And then it, that messes up the whole inner world. The moment you find, for example, patience as a, as a, uh, as a challenge, some people are so incredibly patient they don't do anything anymore. So they become passive. And that's exactly what determined people cannot stand, what they are allergic to. If you have flexibility and you need more consistency, too consistent is rigidity. So flexible people cannot stand rigidity. So the, too much of your challenge is your allergy. And that is one of the most intriguing parts of our inner world that we also have uh, an allergy, which is simply too much of your challenge. Well, then, if you know, if you look at this, this gra graphic and you, you can make quadrants of it, that's what I call a core quadrant. And that's what I'm teaching all over the world at the moment, that there is a relationship between your quality, your pitfall, your challenge, and your allergy. And it's, you don't need to study five years to learn that. You can explain it in, th in three minutes. A core quadrant is a simple tool to help people to understand themselves and uh, to explore their you know, peculiarities. We are, all have our own uh, beautiful sides and pitfalls and allergies. And, and once you start to see that, you understand why, it, it, you know, why we mess up relationships all the time. Because if, if the pitfall of your son is your allergy, you're in for trouble. <laughs> so that happens also. So once you are married to your, to your challenge, the consequence, is, the consequence of that is that you're also married to your own allergy. Well, that, that was never the intention when you got married. And it usually takes a while, sometimes a few weeks, sometimes a few months, sometimes a few years, and then you start to see each other's pitfalls. And you know, then it's, it's also predictable that he says to her, don't be so pushy, and she says to him, don't be so, so passive, or something like that. You get the, the sort of, it's not a dialogue, you know, it's, it's a sort of argument. You can write out these arguments up front. So I have two daughters and you know, they're now having relationships and I tell them, you know, look at your partner and see your challenge and see your allergy. And if you can live with that, if you can accept the too much of your challenge in your partner, then you have a chance. If you can't accept it, you better find out now and not in five years or ten years. So, you know, and it's, 
in a way it's hilarious it's a way it's like we are creating drama all the time in our relationships and it, I know I know there's a, a, a company who, who produces soaps the television programs they they use those quadrants to 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 write the scripts of the soap because if you have two people who complement each other it's fantastic the potential of falling in love is there but the potential of starting to hate each other is there as well. Which were some of the big challenges you had? And maybe you can tell us something about how did you cope with it? And what did you learn from these challenges for yourself? <laughs> I have learned very early in my life to trust intuition. And one of the, the, the challenges there is to discriminate between what is intuition that you have to follow and what is sort of an impulse. So not everything I feel inside is something that requires me to act. Sometimes, for example, some, if I respond from an allergy, it doesn't mean I should do anything. But sometimes it's, it is something that, that is so clear that, I, uh, that it requires me to do something. So, uh, the, the most impo important thing I have learned is to distinguish between the, those two. And when I have something that, for me, feels as an intuition, I act immediately, without thinking about the consequences. Because the consequences, if you start thinking about the consequences, you, you you, the certain things you will never do. For example, um, when I was, uh, I founded a company, Kern Consult, with a partner, with Willem. After 20 years, we were very successful. We were 35 consultants and we had a lot of fun and everything was going well. So there was no problem. And at a certain point, I, I, uh, I decided to uh, to go uh, for a week just to be, you know, alone. I do that sometimes and go for a retreat and I just don't see anybody. And at that moment I uh, took my guitar and I thought, you know, I want to write a song because I used to sing and it was a long time ago that I wrote the song. And suddenly when, uh, when I was by myself, there was a farewell song that came up. And I suddenly realized, I have to go. I have to leave my own company. It's time to move on. Well, these moments, these painful moments, because like, it was like saying goodbye to my own baby. It, I, I created the company and I realized it's time to move on. So I spent a week uh, just by myself crying. I went home and I said, I'm leaving. And I gave away the company. Those challenges I find uh, very rewarding. I'm very great, uh, very happy that I had the guts to, to do it. But it's not easy. It's not easy to follow up. And the same was true when I uh, graduated from university. I was working for Philips. I was 28. And I um, had I had been in, uh, in, in Findhorn, a community in the north of Scotland. I went back to work and on a Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock in the morning, I suddenly, suddenly thought, I have to quit. And I stood up, I went to my boss and I resigned. I sold my house and I moved to Scotland. These, these very important <laughs> decisions they really uh, made me who I am. Can you help me to understand this better? Well, after many, many years, I, I, and I was really struggling with this thing. Sometimes I had a sort of impulse and I, I don't know if I should act or not. And nowadays, it, it, I made it simple. It's a, if, if there's something that comes up in my mind that I, uh, I would like or uh, sort of feels attractive, I sort of create an image. I sort of visualize it. It's like I make a screen here, so let's say half a meter of myself. And I, I, it's like there's a screen here with a picture. And then I wait. And if the screen moves away, I let it go. If it stays, I act. It's like if, if what I'm 
thinking about talks back to me, it doesn't go away, then it's time to act. And when it sort of starts to sort of disappear in the distance, I let it go. Because all the thinking about it doesn't help. That's analyzing. That it makes drives you nuts. You know, you go, go crazy because there are all, all, always lots of reasons why you should do it or should not do it. And da, 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 da. That's all mind, mental stuff. So I, I nowadays uh, sort of do it this way. I create an image and then see if it goes away. I drop it and if it stays, I act immediately. So this also confirms the importance that is in some uh, coaching models or training schools given to visualizing things. And see I th what yes. the effect of visualization is on yourself. I think if you, if you cannot visualize what you want, you don't know what you want. <laughs> so it's important that, you, that, you, that we learn to visualize our wishes, our desires. What does it look like? Um, for example, when, when in, this one of, in one of these quadrants, if somebody might say, would say, uh, I'd like to be more uh, assertive. I said, okay, that sounds nice. Is that, is that a challenge for you, to be more assertive? Okay, what would your day look like? Imagine you wake up in the morning and you are assertive, and you go you know, to your work and you're in a traffic jam and you are in a meeting. See yourself being assertive. What does it look like? So imagine imagine what you would like, where you would like to be. And the more clearly you can see what it is you would like, the easier it is to, to sort of to get it. It's like if I make an image, it's like the image becomes a magnet and attracts me in that direction. That's why I think don't work on it, <laughs> make it clear what you want and then trust the universe. <laughs> Because you will, you know, you will be drawn to it if you invest in, in making it more clear. But don't start to talk about how, 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 how. I mean, the, the, for, in my opinion, the problem is hardly ever how to get somewhere. The problem is most of the time, what is it you want? What is it you would like to create? What is it you would like to, to be? Be. Uh, and visualizing it, imagining is very, very helpful. The core quadrant concept is just a concept. Um, for me, the philosophy behind it is much more important. The, the, the model is just a model. The, the philosophy is, you know, focus on what you are for, not what you are against. Um, so don't try to get rid of your pitfall see how you can add something to your life, your challenge, which I, you are for. That message, I think, is very important. Don't fight. Don't uh, make sure your mindset starts with yes rather than no. Um, don't be reactive, because reaction, reactive means that you start with something you, you say no to. And in the quadrant, that's, for example, your pitfall and your and your allergy. Focus what you say yes to. It's like sort of what do you pay attention to? To, what, to your inner no or your inner yes? Well, that's the quadrant is an expression of that thinking. Um, and I find that far more important than, than the model itself. So make sure that you find your inner yes. What do you say yes to? What do you want to create? What do you want to contribute, what is it you want to uh, leave behind on this planet, uh, what would fulfill your, give fulfillment to your life. Daniel, a few years ago you had uh, in Europe a conference for people who are trained in core qualities, yes. so certified people, and the point on the agenda was the core or the center yeah. of the quadrant. Yes. What's, what's that? Well, that's the point where what I was talking about when, when your quality and your challenge are combined. So if you are patiently determined that you bring together these qualities. If you are flexibly structured, if you uh, are 
you know, if you are, uh, you, you confront people and you are, have empathy at the same time, that's, that's where challenge and quality come together. Yeah. Which is the most important part of the whole quadrant, because that's, for most people that's a new experience, to experience yourself being patient and determined at the same time. It's not either or, but it's to be both at the same time. And the first time you experience that moment where you are in balance is most of the time very impressive. So I, have, I let people walk their quadrants and then see if they can, if that helps. We can talk about it a lot, uh, but to, to physically feel it inside your, your, your body is, is fantastic. Was I was, yeah, uh, no, no, I, I, I remember the moment. Yes. It was in uh, February, and it, I know the place, and uh, it is in Garderen. Garderen is a place in the Netherlands, uh, and there's a hotel called Spilders Boss. And usually, when I work with a group, I, I f during lunchtime, I go for a walk just by myself. And I was walking in the in the wood, and I saw four boxes and uh, I often have images and, and the, the, the upper two boxes were quality and pitfall. I didn't call it pitfall then but it was the quality and distortion. I was just you know, playing with the idea that qualities have distortions and, and now I call it pitfalls. And the other two were empty, the, the, the lower two and it sort of filled itself in within Seconds, maybe minutes. I don't, I don't remember. But it was, it was complete. It was quality pitfall challenge allergy, and I walked back to the group and I just drew it on, on a flip chart, uh, and I didn't have the faintest idea of how it would change my life. <laughs> it was just one of those, you know, uh, things that sometimes pop up. Uh, and then I discovered that uh, I started working with it, and people liked it, and other colleagues started to use it. And my partner in, in Can Consult, he at a certain point said, you know, if you don't write a book about this, somebody else will. And then I thought, that would be a pity <laughs> if somebody else would write it. So I decided to write my first book. It was a wonderful tip. From this person. Yes, he was very insistent. He, he just, you know, because I, I, I thought I couldn't write. I'd never written a book mm -hmm. before. So, uh, in, in the end, when it was finished, I thought, okay, this is it. Now I can move on and do something else. Come up with another idea. It's like a sort of crazy idea that you always have to be original. <laughs> uh, and then I discovered that it just took off. The book became a bestseller. and. It, and now, you know, there are books in, in, in more than 10 languages about it, so it, it never stopped. It's just developing and uh, becoming more, uh, finding out more depth behind it. The beginning was simply for boxes, and now it's a whole way of life. So uh, I've been busy with this for 25 years, and do you, probably... Do you, do, you, uh, do you see it as your model? No, no, it's, uh, I didn't come up, this is how the universe works. <laughs> if I work in China, the first response of people in China is, oh, that's yin yang. They immediately recognize it, because it is a polarity model. The yes. quality and challenge are complementing qualities. That, I didn't invent that, that has always been like that. I just happened to, you know, to give words, I, I created a, a, a a language that helps people to understand it easier. But the concept is universal. That's why it is so popular. That's why everybody, wherever I come, whatever country, they all recognize it. Which advice would you give to trainers who use your model? <laughs> um, Live it first before you teach it. Uh, make sure that it, it's not a mental, the, the, the danger of the corporate is the mental construction. So make sure that people can experience 
their quality, that they they know how it feels if you are when you are in balance. These these rare moments where you are in the middle of the, of the quadrants. So the worst thing that people can do is that they focus too much on the content. The words have to fit. That's the mental part. But the experience of the concord, that you can really appreciate yourself for, for, your, you know, for the beauty that you have in your qualities, that's the most important thing. The mental part is, helps, but it's, it's only a part, it's only a small part. So that's one thing, and the second thing is, and I say this every day, the world is not waiting for people who know their core qualities. <laughs> The world is waiting for people who know themselves and that, that knowledge helps them to take responsibility and, and helps them to make choices that contribute to this planet. Because if your awareness about yourself does not make you take responsibility, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point in, in finding out this stuff about yourself? So awareness is fantastic. but. Awareness, when you take no responsibility, uh, for me it's useless. So help people to wake up, find out who they are, become more aware, and take responsibility. That would be my message to everyone who works with this. My dream is that this process of finding out who you are starts at primary school. It starts with children at the age of 9, 10. You can teach core coordinates to children of 10 years old. And uh, the, the earlier you get interested in your, you know, your own development, the better. It is just sad to see that you know, people, some people only find out these things about themselves when they're 55. <laughs> this should be part of our educational system. So that's why I also wrote a children's book with Albert Heymeyer, just to help kids to get interested in this kind of stuff. So 20 is too late. I mean, so start at set eight, nine, ten years, and then you lose them a few years when they go into puberty, but they come back. So it's sowing seeds at an early age. Uh, so it's important that teachers know this stuff about themselves and about their kids. And, and there is no job more important, I think, than teaching, teaching children. So that's where it belongs. Uh, how can we implement the core quality system in the educational system? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we have done uh, pilot uh, programs in schools. Uh, helping teachers to, to, first of all, apply to themselves, just like, you know, with, with trainers and, and professionals, the same is true for teachers. You can only teach this if you apply it to yourself. If you don't know this in yourself, if you don't know your allergies and your pitfalls, and, your, and then teachers cannot teach it to, to the kids. So it, it, that's why it is so important that it becomes an integral part of our educational system. I don't know when, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that we, we will, uh, in, in, in the future generations, we will spend more time to find out who we are. It's, it's inevitable. The moment I realized the, the, the beauty of the core quadrant, I knew it would go all over the planet. My question just was, will I be, will I be part of that? <laughs> so far, a little bit, yeah. and I hope it will go very fast. But there's no way we can plan it. We'll have to see. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your time, your dedication, and your, your passion for the core quadrants and everything around it, especially for the philosophy behind it. I wish you all the best. Thank you.